There is a long and storied history of Catholicism in England, not all of it pleasant. For a period of three centuries, Catholic priests and laity in England were persecuted and even martyred for practicing their faith. How has the Catholic Church survived in England? And what does English Catholicism look like today? Here to discuss all of this, as well as Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee, is the author of the new book, Faith of Our Fathers, A History of True England, Joseph Pierce. Welcome back to the show, Joseph. Your book is a thorough historical account of how Catholicism has survived in England and covers about 2,000 years, beginning with the arrival of the first Christian missionaries around the year 63, to the reconsecration of England to the Blessed Virgin during the COVID lockdown in 2020. Why did you decide to write this book and cover such a large span of time? Well, I think that, you know, that everything is ultimately subject to the truth, uh, and not just the truth itself, but the truth himself, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So for me, I wanted to tell the story of true England, which is the England that's remained true to the truth himself. And so that Christian presence goes back now almost 2,000 years, as you rightly say, from about 30 years after the crucifixion, uh, 63 AD, uh, right through to, to the present day. Hmm. Paganism lasted in England for several centuries, well after Catholicism had started to spread. One of the turning points that ended paganism was in 596, when Pope Gregory the Great sends St. Augustine to England. How did St. Augustine bring Catholicism to the island? Well, St. Gregory the Great, as you said, sent St. Augustine as, uh, as a missionary. Uh, the Catholic Church had had a presence in England for half a millennium at this point, which should, which should be mm -hmm. reiterate. But following the withdrawal of the Romans with the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, pagan tribes started to move into England from various parts of the Germanies, Germanic-speaking tribes. And so England was in danger of becoming pagan again, although there were still certainly Christian elements in England. So that great Pope uh, Gregory sent uh, St. Augustine, who was a monk with some companions, they converted uh, the king of Kent, the kingdom in the southeast of England, just over the sea from, from France, and Dover, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, St. Augustine and other Christian missionaries spread the faith very quickly. I mean, by the end of the following century, the whole of England was Catholic. Whole kingdoms were converting um, in, very, in very quick mm -hmm. succession. So once St. Once Augustine arrived, things happened quickly. Mm. You write that one of the most important events with respect to the spread of Christianity throughout England was the Synod of Withby in 664. What happened and how did that shape the future of Catholicism on the island? No, well, so obviously what happened is that the English Catholicism before the arrival of St. Augustine had been very influenced by, by, by the Irish uh, Celtic mm -hmm. Christianity, which was very Catholic. But there were anomalies, including the, you know, the date that Easter was celebrated. So the Synod of the Whitby confirmed uh, and conformed uh, English Catholicism to, to the Church of Rome. And so the, the, the celebration of Easter uh, and other uh, parts of the liturgical year were based in conformity with the universal teaching of the Church. So that was the most important thing of it. It ensured that English Catholicism was Roman Catholicism. Hmm. Uh, that, that Reformation period, of course, was a major crisis for the church in England. Uh, it lasted, you had executions from the 1530s to 1680s, where priests and laity were constantly being put to death. You write that in the midst of that suffering and with waves of martyrdom, English Catholics found solace in parallels between themselves and the persecuted Christians of the early church. How did that 150-year period or so of intense Catholic persecution shaped the faith in England, and how did it differ from other countries who were also affected by the Reformation? Well, the, 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 the thing we have to remember is there were really not there wasn't one Reformation; there were three. There was the uh, mm -hmm. the Protestant Reformation, you know, heralded by Luther and Calvin, etc. There was the Catholic Reformation, which is sometimes called the Counter Reformation, and there was the English mm -hmm. Reformation because Henry VIII uh, was purely a Machiavellian, self-serving tyrant. He wasn't a Protestant, therefore, the, the, the English the English Reformation, so called, was basically just uh, dissolving the monasteries, taking away the power of the church, giving the church lands to uh, the king's own cronies. Um, and uh, basically take, taking the faith of the English people away from them 
by force against their will. So there was very little appetite in England in the 1530s for Protestantism. England was a very and profoundly Catholic country, and the king and his henchmen ripped the Catholic faith away from the ordinary people of England. And as you rightly said there, following that, 150 years of executions, followed by a further 150 years of persecutions. So 300 years of, 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 uh, of the, the Catholics in England being treated as second-class citizens. But how did it shape them? How did it reshape the faith as we have it today? Well, I think it purified them. In actual fact, in the history of true England, I actually see that period of persecution as something uh, not just uh, analogous to, to the early Christians and the catacombs and the martyrs, though it certainly is, but also I think ultimately, in terms of uh, the archetype, uh, it should be analogous to the Passion of Christ. It was that the, the Christians of England being crucified for their faith. Uh, and if you like, the faith of England being resurrected, first of all, in the hearts of those martyrs uh, and those uh, who worship with them. But also, I think, in, in, in the, if you like, it sowed the seeds for the Catholic revival, which begins with the conversion of St. John Henry Newman in 1845, yeah. which is the resurrection, yeah, and if the, you like, the, after the... Yes, and you, I know you, you mark uh, Newman's conversion as a major turning point of Catholicism in England. There, and also some wonderful English literature uh, comes from converts primarily, uh, Chesterton and Tolkien. And, and really the earliest grand literary works stem from England. You say, quote, the late 7th and early 8th centuries also heralded the birth of English literature. Cademan, uh, the earliest known of all English poets, was a monk at Whitby Abbey. And it is to this period that Beowulf, the great English epic, belongs, a profoundly Catholic work, irrespective of its woeful and willful misreading by modern critics, Beowulf was almost certainly written by a monk. How is Beowulf influenced by Catholicism, and what leads you to believe it was written by a monk? Well, a couple of things I would say about it. Beowulf, for those who, who don't know it, is basically divided into Beowulf's struggles with three separate monsters. In the first two, the monsters are demons. Uh, and what, what the, the, the epic shows us is the errors of the heresy of Pelagianism. Now, Pelagianism was rife in, 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 in England in the early days of Christianity there. And it's very much a modern heresy. It's, it's really the self-help heresy. Because what Pelagius taught was you don't need the sacraments, you don't need the church, you don't need grace. You just have to, you can get to heaven by the triumph of your own will, by self-help. You just do what Jesus mm. says and you get to heaven. Um, mm. So what Beowulf shows us is that Beowulf is the mightiest warrior. He is the strongest warrior. Uh, and he has the best technology, the greatest sword that's ever been made. And even the most mighty warrior with the most mighty sword cannot defeat the power of evil without supernatural assistance. In other words, a symbol for grace, which is in the form of a magical or miraculous sword that has uh, elements of salvation history inscribed on their hilt. And it's with this miraculous, mm -hmm. ultimately supernatural sword symbolizing grace that, 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 that man can defeat evil only with God's help. So it's a profoundly theological work um, and uh, mm. very influential for people such as Tolkien, as you say. So it's a, a major, yeah. major pillar of Western civilization. And, and I want to talk about present-day England. Um, this week marks, of course, the celebration of Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee, 70 years on the throne, the longest-serving monarch in England's history. How significant is this celebration in the history of England? And then I want to talk about what happens next. Yes, well, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth II is a very interesting person. As she's got older, she's got more Catholic friendly. Uh, if you listen to her Christmas Day message to the, to the people of England and the, and, and the Commonwealth, uh, her allusions to the church uh, uh, have got much more favorable. When she, was, when she was younger, she was sort of a low church Protestant, and now she's very much a high church, uh, at least crypto Catholic. Um, so I, we've certainly seen her moving in the right direction. And I would say as well that for someone to have been on the phone for 70 years and the gossip columnists don't have one single uh, thing on her, uh, that demands and commands respect. And so I think that England has been blessed by the Queen as a monarch. Mm. And I think that uh, she has had a beneficial impact in the sense that she does have a traditionalist, a uh, traditional understanding of morality, of Christianity. And although she's not mm -hmm. um, a Catholic, members of the royal family have been converting recently. So I see hope for the future.
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, because obviously uh, Protestantism is the, Protest is the predominant religion, and Queen Elizabeth is, quote, the defender of the faith and head of the Church of England. What is the state of that church today? Last year, four Anglican bishops left the Church of England and converted to Catholicism. So tell me about the state of that church and the prohibitions on Catholics entering the line of monarchical succession. Could that be adapted, changed? Well, the, 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 first of all, it's quite evident now, by far, that the largest Christian presence in England is the Catholic presence. The Anglican Church has collapsed. It's collapsed basically because of the decadence of its own modernist theology. And there are lessons there for all of us to learn. If you, if, if you borrow, Chesterton mm. said, we don't want a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. Well, the Anglican Church has mm. been trying to move with the world and has collapsed. So that's a, that's a, a, a message. The good news, however, is that the, the Catholic Church has stepped into the vacuum, stepped into the breach, so to speak. And you're correct, there's been uh, several bishops who have converted. There's also been um, hundreds of Anglican clergymen that have, that have converted, many of them becoming priests. So um, the Catholic Church is the dominant Christian presence in England now. And as and when and if, and by the grace of God, when uh, England uh, is, is converted, it will be a Catholic country again. Hmm. What, do you, what do you think? Obviously, Charles is going to assume the throne at some point, probably soon. The queen is 96. What does that portend for the monarch as head of the Church of England, given the eviscerated shape it finds itself in? Well, there's an anomalous situation. Prince Charles is a bit of a bit of a, an anomalous situation himself. Um, for instance, uh, some time back, he said he didn't want to be known as the defender of the faith, but merely as the defender of faith, whatever on earth that means, in order to be inclusive mm -hmm. of other religions. So uh, there's there, there's that there's that direction we can go in. Of course, the title defender of the faith was some given by the Pope. I wanted to end with the eighth. Defense, the defense or <laughs> so ultimately, uh, if the monarchy is going to have any uh, significance as regards the faith of the people of England, that the monarch has to defend the faith of true England. In other words, the history of of, uh, of the Catholic faith in England for two thousand years. That's that's the only meaningful religion that England as a nation and a culture and a people and a history has ever known. And what we really need is the mm. reunification of the monarchy to the to the fact of England's faith. Wow, what a message. And, and your uh, warning earlier about the state of the Anglican Church and others who dare follow it, and as we were talking earlier in the program, it seems there are forces within Catholicism wanting to move it in that direction, in the direction of the world. We'll see how that pans out, but uh, I hope people listen to your warning, Joseph. I'll give you the last word. Sure, and I, 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 you know, I think ultimately the lesson we see from the history of England and from contemporary issues in the church is that we have to choose between the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Age. If we choose the Spirit of the Age, we have no future. Choose the Holy Spirit, we have mm. a future here on earth and a future in heaven. Mm. We will leave it there. Faith of Our Fathers, A History of True England by Joseph Pierce is available now at bookstores everywhere. Thank you for coming. Don't make yourself a stranger.